If you would uh, turn over to the uh, book of Malachi, we um, think I left off at the fourth verse of chapter 3, I believe it was. Yep. Fourth verse of chapter 3. <clears throat> And previously, in the beginning uh, chapter 3, uh, before we do that, let's, let's have just a short word of prayer. Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the study of ours that we may gain greater knowledge of thy will for us in this life, that being obedient to that, that uh, will, we may gain the life to come. We pray for all who are engaged in this study that they may give their full attention to it and and their heart to uh, a, a diligent study of that word. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It started out uh, chapter 3 with um, talking about uh, his messenger. I'm going to send his messenger. And uh, he will prepare the way before me. And that uh, is contained in, contained in the uh, Old Testament. See, I had uh, had that written down here. But it talked about uh, the um, let's see if I have that. Oh, that's my other book. <laughs> I don't have that here. But anyway, you can look at uh, uh, Matthew 11, chapter verses 10 and 14, and 17 and 12, and Luke 1 and 7. It's all talking about uh, the uh, messenger that is to come. And uh, uh, in Isaiah 40, verse 3, that's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's repeated again in the uh, New Testament. It's referring to uh, this particular messenger, referring to John the Baptist. And uh, it said in the New Testament that you know he was the Elijah that was that was coming. So th this section is is a uh, has many messianic implications. It's it's talking about the coming of the Messiah. And it came down to verse uh, four as to the offering of uh, Judah and Jerusalem. And Judah is the uh, nation. And, of course, Jerusalem is the uh, city. The offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord, as in the days of old. In the days of old, when uh, Judah and Jerusalem were faithful, it, it was pleasant to the Lord. As in the days of old, as in former years. <clears throat> and I will come near to you for judgment... And this is really the answer to uh, chapter 2, verse uh, 17. It said, I will be a swift witness against sorcer sorcerers, against adulterers, perjurers, and each of those are condemned, in, particularly in Leviticus, uh, and against those who exploit wage earners and widows and the fatherless. And... Uh, that is explicitly uh, forbidden in Exodus. When you look at chapter 22, verse 21, 24. And against those who turn away an alien. Of course, the Jews were famous for turning away aliens. They wouldn't have anything to do with Gentiles. But anyway, because they do not fear me, there's, there's no... Uh, these people that he's talking about uh, in answer to this accusation of, you know, um, of chapter 2, verse 17, uh, these people, they have no restraint against evil. You know, they do just about what they want to because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. If you don't fear, that is, respect the uh, Lord of hosts, if you don't respect uh, God our Father and uh, his will for us, then there is no restraint against evil. What, what is there to prevent someone uh, from uh, committing evil? 
Now you may say, well, there's atheists that that uh, are very moral, and I'm sure that there are. But what is it that causes them to be moral? It's not the atheism. It's got to be some other standard to which they uh, comply in order for them to be moral. I mean, what does it mean to be moral? You know, it's got to be some sort of uh, objective standard to specify what is moral. How do you determine that? <clears throat> and uh, I've heard some atheists say, well, a long uh, tradition of people have determined that a certain behavior is uh, more beneficial than another sort of behavior. Well, who says that? <laughs> who says that? You know, we always you like to use Hitler. Did Hitler say that? <laughs> you know, he, he executed about six million people, not mention the ones that died, you know, in fighting and civilians that died, but he actually executed six million people <clears throat> because he had his own definition of what was moral. He did not did not use a definition that uh, was derived from uh, the God of heaven. And it says in verse 6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. And of course, James 1.17 says there's no shadow of turning. You know, uh, he's the same today and tomorrow. And this really is talking about his... Uh, uh, divine nature, uh, and mercy, and judgment, that never changes. His love for mankind never changes. His uh, punishment of disobedient, dis disobedience never changes. He does not change. So you can be assured that the way that he uh, viewed sin back in the time of uh, Moses is the same way that he views sin today. And when we get into Hebrews, we'll see that that uh, the way that, if you want to call it, interacts with us uh, has changed. It's, it's not the same as it was in the Old Testament. But we'll, we'll get into that when we get into the uh, book of Hebrews. But he says in verse uh, 6, you know, again, I, I am the Lord, I do not change. I, that's his divine nature, his, his uh, attitude towards mercy and, and his judgment. None of that changes. Therefore, you are not consumed, sons of Jacob. <clears throat> there's, always, there's always a remnant left. There's always a remnant. And uh, which means there's always some that are faithful. And it is true in the case of Daniel, for example, those that are faithful may still suffer. But God would all always be true to those that are faithful. He will bless those that are faithful. But if the nation is evil, I'm trying to think of one nation that's evil. Well, I'm trying to think of one nation that's not evil. <laughs> But, you know, since we're in the United States, the uh, moral condition of the nation is really taking a uh, nosedive, if you, if you will. And the nation may be punished as a result of it. You know, I don't know. Uh, I know God will punish uh, disobedience. And exactly how he will do that, I, you know, I can't see the future. I don't know how that is. But... Uh, there is a remnant. There are those that are faithful. And the faithful may suffer along with the, those that are punished. But in the end, God will show mercy on those who are faithful. And it says uh, in verse 7, uh, Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Uh, return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. And like I said, this is a uh, didactic, dialectic type of uh, book. So they say, or he's, he's saying, but you said, 
in what way shall we return? And if you think about it, uh, you know, God's blessings and his disobedience, his, his punishment, are all conditional. And, but it's kind of, you know, these people have a long history of uh, what God has done for them. And he, they are bound to be able to see that God has punished disobedience in the past and he was, has rewarded obedience with blessings. They're bound to have seen that. <coughs> but uh, they didn't believe it. The very fact that they ask, in what way shall we return, that's a really very disrespectful to God himself that they cannot answer that question. And, of course, God responds, well, he's asking the question for him, will a man rob God? Uh, yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? But well, I thought the money that they gave in tithes tithe and offerings was theirs to begin with. How can you rob somebody by withholding what was yours in the first place? Well, the way that uh, these individuals have robbed them, that they did not uh, concede the fact that everything belongs to God. We're stewards of what we have. And but he's a steward of that coat that he has on and when I go outside he may want to let me be the steward of it. <laughs> Probably not, but <laughs> he might. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is we are stewards of our physical possessions. And if we are able to, to earn uh, income, whatever it is, that's a blessing from God that allows us to do that. Everything belongs to God. But our contribution is recognition of that everything belongs to him, that we are, we are stewards. And to the extent that we uh, contribute of our means is an indication of how much we believe that, that he, in fact, is a steward. And he says here, uh, you know, you are cursed with a curse. Uh, because tithes and offerings are, they're holy to the Lord. He said, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Then he makes a uh, uh, kind of a challenge to them. And it should be a challenge to us today also. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. <clears throat> of course, we don't bring food in, into the store. We, uh, you know, we use money as a medium of exchange. It's much more convenient than trying to bring in a, a sack of oats or anything like that. And but uh, we we use money. But bring it into the storehouse. And of course, that would be in this case the church treasury. That there may be food in a, my house. That may be the means to support the uh, activities of the church. And as long as we, of course, uh, engage in uh, charitable works and what have you, spreading the gospel. He said, do that. And prove me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. So the Lord is saying to them, uh, you do your part and I'll do my part. But I will be sure and faithful that my part will be done. And you, the, you're the one that decides whether your part will be done. But try me and see if I don't uh, bless you. He goes on to say, See uh, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven. And that's just a, a manner of speech to say the blessings. See if the blessings don't come down as, as a result of your uh, recognizing that 
you know, everything belongs to me anyway, and, and so forth. See if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there, there will not be room enough uh, to receive it. And uh, this same idea is given in Deuteronomy uh, 30, uh, verse 5, and also Ezekiel 36, verse 11, if you want to look, look those up, write them down and look them up later. But this is a uh, great lesson for us, and I, and I would venture to say that those uh, who are very generous with their contributions, say, they really don't miss it. Because the very nature of it is that, uh, you know, if you recognize that all things belong to God, and you're very generous in giving back to God what is is the very nature of doing that, you will so uh, adjust your uh, life that you're just not going to miss it. You will not miss it. Now, you may not be able to engage in the same things that the uh, uh, those that are unfaithful may engage in, but you don't miss that either. <laughs> you don't care to do those things. You so conform your life to the will of heaven, you just, you know, you're happy being able to give generously to the Lord. And he goes on in verse 11 to say, and I will rebuke the devourer, the devourer for your sakes. That, uh, of course, this is a agrarian society, so the, the devourer be the devourer of their crops, uh, the locusts, hail, mildew, blight, and, and uh, things like that. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Those are all very important agricultural products uh, in an agrarian society in, the, in that area. In verse 12, and all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a, a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. So if they are faithful to the Lord in all things and they give their means, uh, they're going to be blessed beyond their imagination. And the nations round about them are going to look at them and say, this is a, this is a nice place. <laughs> you know. And they might, might just ask, you know, what, why are you so, uh, why is this such a delightful land? What, what are you doing? But the people... <clears throat> say your words have been harsh against me and I think the King James uh, version says stout and so does the ASB stout uh, strong or uh, probably the New King James as good as any uh, harsh <coughs> your words have been harsh against me says the Lord yet you say what have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. Vain, of course, which just means uh, uh, useless, uh, no profit, uh, no gain to it. It is vain to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance? Now you think about this a moment. It, uh, it's almost the idea that if you want me to be faithful to you, you got to pay me. And of course, that's the, the wrong attitude to uh, to have. But that's kind of the idea that this is. You know, is there any profit in me being obedient? You know, what's in it for me? So, what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance? in that we have walked as mourners. And I might add that this uh, word mourners is the only time in the entire Old Testament that this word is used. But you think about that society back then, um, whenever there's, let's say, uh, let's say there's a death, they would have mourners. 
and they may be paid more, but they would, uh, that was just kind of generally conceded that you, you had to have somebody do in the morning. But so again, the mourners gain some sort of profit. So it's still the same idea that you know we should be paid for this for being obedient, and that we uh, have walked as mourners before the Lord. So now we call the proud blessed and those who do wickedness are raised up. And that's what the people are saying. Yet those who tempt God go free. So in essence, what they are uh, asserting is that uh, good is evil and evil is good. <laughs> They're just... And I think that's a lot of what's going on today. So um, you might find that idea uh, in Isaiah, the fifth chapter, verse 20. It's talking about the uh, uh, good for evil, evil, evil for good. And, you, you know, again, you look at uh, the, this society today. And if you are to do something that you do it simply because the New Testament requires you to do it, you may be called an evil person for doing it. And uh, with our woke society, those things that the Bible clearly condemns, uh, if you condemn them yourself, because the Bible condemns them, you're going to be called... Um, Oh, uh, malicious or gender hating or uh, whatever the woke culture uh, opposes, you know, you, you know, the Bible condemns. If you, you, you condemn it also, you're going to have some retribution for it. <clears throat> and that's the idea that, that uh, nowadays virtue is uh, perversion and perversion is virtue. Evil is good, good is evil. Then verse 16, then those who feared the, feared the Lord, and there's always a few. There's always a few in any society that uh, uh, fear the Lord, even though they may suffer along with those that uh, are punished. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him. Now, <clears throat> I do recall somebody... Uh, Living the lessons on the uh, is your name written in heaven or your name written in the book of life. There's going to be a there is a book of remembrance. Now it's not a, an actual book because God does not need an actual book. There's nothing wrong with His memory. He remembers everything. But for our benefit, it is mentioned that there is a a book of remembrance to remind us that the things that we do in this life, we're going to, it's going to be called for an account. God is going to remember those things. That's the book of life. It says, so a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord. That's, again, the few that are faithful. And who meditate on his name and uh, meditate is you know the word is used in various ways to think about uh, or esteem or something like that but I think meditate is uh, you know, probably as good a word as any verse 17 says they shall be mine says the Lord again he's talking about the faithful the few faithful on the day that I make them my jewels, that's the uh, day of judgment, they're going to be in, in the jewels in the, uh, the, the crown of heaven. And I will spare them. They're not going to suffer the same judgment that the evil is going to uh, suffer. He said, I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. And this is a son that is faithful to his father. So there's there's a very it indicates that there's there's a very intimate relationship there uh, from 
from God to the faithful. Very intimate relationship. Then you shall discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Uh, so that's dealing with judgment and uh, redemption. And all throughout here, and, and really throughout the Bible, there is the uh, a recurrent theme of uh, judgment and redemption. In chapter 4, for behold the days, the day is coming, and that's the day of judgment's coming, burning like an oven. And it's not like uh, the uh, whirlpool oven or a manna. You know, oven. It's not the same sort of deal. It's their kind of ovens. There was fire in there, so it's a it's a very uh, intense fire, devouring fire. It said burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, who uh, do wickedly, wickedly will be stubble. And you recall the, the agricultural practices back then that you know they would cut the grain, what have you, and it would leave stubble. And a lot of times they would just burn that stubble to get rid of uh, weeds and, and pests and so forth. And they used to do that around here. I don't think they do that much anymore. Uh, and the day which is coming shall uh, burn them up. That's the day of judgment's coming. will burn them up. And we see that same idea in Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, if you want to look that up. Uh, it says, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. And when you get rid of the roots and the branches, then not much left. Uh, but you who fear my name, again, that's the uh, faithful, the few faithful that he's talking about. The son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. Now, the sun, uh, of course, uh, you know, we get the light during the day from the sun. Uh, the light rays uh, sustain growth, and it's very necessary. And it, uh, if you think about the, the wings of a bird that uh, provides uh, protection, and so there's healing there, the, the sun of righteousness is it can be an allusion to, it, to Jesus himself because he is the, uh, the righteous one. There's going to be healing there. Uh, talking about the faithful, his wings are for protection. So there's going to be protection there. And now you may not know much about uh, stall-fed calves, but if you really wanted good cut of meat, you you would stall feed them. You wouldn't let them just eat grass. You know, you may let them feed on grass for a while, but then you'd bring them in and you'd fatten them up on uh, feed. And that's, that, that's what's done up in North Texas, Panhandle, where they have thousands of cattle in, in uh, feedlots. And they feed them. They don't eat grass. They feed them. And that's you know, when the farmers sell cows to auctioneers, they put them in trucks, they ship them up to Panhandle in, in Texas and feed them, what's called feed them out. They provide feed for them, and that's where they really get nice and tender for, for whatever awaits them. But anyway, uh, you grow fat like stall-fed calves, like calves in a uh, feed yard. And you shall trample the uh, wicked, and they shall be ashes on the sole of your feet. That the faithful are going to defeat the wicked. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts, <coughs> remember the law of Moses, uh, my servant. And wasn't that the message of John the Baptist? You know, the messenger that's coming. Wasn't he saying to uh, you need to repent and and uh, be faithful to the law of Moses. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb, uh, and that's Sinai, for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. 
Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. And of course, uh, uh, John the Baptist was called Elijah, which already come. Uh, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike earth with a curse. And that's it. We're right on time. <laughs> so next uh, Wednesday night we'll... Uh, you know, I started the introduction to Hebrews. I'm going to continue with the introduction to Hebrews. Hebrews is, is um, probably going to be, at least I'm thinking, it's going to be a very in, intense study. And there's going to be a lot of uh, scriptural references to other, other scriptures. There's many uh, Old Testament verses that are quoted in Hebrews and the message to the Hebrews are just important to us today as it was to them so I think you'll find it a very interesting and profitable study so you're dismissed <laughs>